Hello, folks. Welcome to Holding On with Holder, where I talk to interesting people about interesting topics. My name is Steve Holder, and I am your host. My guest this evening is Professor D.R. Schreiber, magician, magical consultant, and historian. He calls himself a historical conjurer. Welcome, sir. Glad to have you with me. Greetings and salutations to you, Steve. Thank you so much for inviting me on your show. I appreciate it. Glad to have you here. So tell us about your background. How would you describe yourself? Absolutely. Well, yes, as you mentioned, I am the historical conjurer. Um, I am a magician. That's probably the more common term. But uh, I take my audiences back to a time when magic was first evolving as an entertainment art form back into the 18th century, uh, a time that your audience might know is that a time of Jane Austen or, or Bridgerton which is kind of the popular show now. And uh, back in that time period, magicians and magic really were very closely aligned with science and discovery. It was an age of enlightenment. And it was a, a very different time for magicians because we were not so much puzzles to be solved, but we were really kind of leading the edge in scientific exploration. And that's the area that I work in. And it brings a little bit more of the artistry back to magic. And you know, really what I'm asking my audience to do is you know, suspend your disbelief for a little while and enjoy the trip with me back in time to a, a you know, I don't want to say an easier time, but a different time than what we have today. Yeah. Well, that sounds very interesting. How did you become interested in being a magician or illusionist? Is that, is that which, which <laughs> You're absolutely illusionist? right. And technically, I would be called a magician because yeah. uh, the illusionist didn't really start until the Victorian era when we really okay. started to work with uh, illusion. A lot of the things that I do are not necessarily illusion, but more uses of dexterity or scientific devices, things like that. So you're correct in that term, to really to call me more of a magician. But um, my interest really started as a, as a child. My mother was a school teacher and she used magic in her classroom to entertain the kids. And um, I was a kid and I was entertained. And so she would often teach me a trick or two here and there. And then as I got a little older, when my later primary grades, I actually saw an actual real magician perform. And um, he's a person actually I still keep in touch with today. And uh, he inspired me to, to learn more about it. And I just, I love the way that the audience reacted to them, how the, you know, the people were able to, you know, laugh and, and go along with his stories and really just enjoy the whole entertainment aspect of it. Yeah. And it wasn't until much later in my life that I began to actually take it more seriously and part perform publicly and, and do all those things. But really what happened is I took my, my interest in history. I was fortunate that my parents, when I was young, took me on the Freedom Trail through Boston and Colonial Williamsburg and a lot of those 18th century era places on the East Coast of the United States and exposed me to people dressed in costume and living these lifestyles of long ago. And I really enjoyed that. Later in life, I went to Renaissance fairs and realized that there were people who liked to be able to be in costume. Yeah. And I put the two together. I put magic and history together and became the historical conjurer. Okay, very good. So what is your favorite trick? I'm sure you've been asked that a million times. <laughs> My favorite, uh, it's like asking someone who their favorite child is, and you're not supposed to have oh, okay. favorites, right? But um, it, it kind of depends on what I'm doing for the day. I have um, one demonstration that I do, and I, I can't do it right here, where I have a, a deck of cards that I throw in the air and fire my pistol and shoot the selected deck, the selected card out of the air, and it shoots onto the wall or onto the ceiling wherever the aim of the audience member is. That's probably one of my favorite. Now I have to admit though, that that's not an original uh, that actually dates back to 1790. It was performed by a conjurer by the name of Giuseppe Panetti. He was very famous for this uh, demonstration. And that's probably my favorite that I do. Um, and I don't know any other magicians that still perform it that way. Um, it's done different ways, but the method that I use with the, uh, the pistol, the way that Panetti had done it originally is very unique. To, to me at least, um, I'm sure there's others who do it. There's enough magicians out there in the world that we all kind of copy each other, I guess. But yeah. um, I, I admit that my act and my show is not unique to me. The fact that I'm not making up things that others haven't done. I'm copying things that were done 200 plus years ago. And yeah. uh, I think that's where I'm unique is a lot of magicians don't go back to those old 
the old illusions, the old demonstrations. Of, you know, I'm, I'm going back in time to those old things and trying to show what magic was like before the age of the internet and yeah. video and other things like that. Yeah. So how long have you been doing this now? Um, this exact character, the, the historical conjurer for about, I guess, four, 14 years now. And um, I, I won a number of awards for this and I've performed throughout the world. Unfortunately, the last year, I've been kind of been confined to this box area. Yeah. Um, but again, great thing about doing things over Zoom is that, uh, and over the internet and YouTube and other things that I'm able to connect with people around the globe that I wouldn't normally be able to perform for. And um, so I've made a lot of contacts this way, but uh, this exact character for a little over a decade, for about 14, 15 years. And then of course I also teach magic too, but I've been performing magic for well, well over three decades uh, at this point. But uh, really this is the character that I've now commonly embraced. And um, I really try to you know, expand that artistry of what magic can be and um, really try to change it from being a puzzle into being an art form. And so it's more of just an entertainment or hopefully the audience can relax and enjoy and hear some stories about people from long ago. Yeah. Does it ever get boring for you doing it the same so much so long? Well, it's that you ask that because uh, there's been some conversation amongst magicians lately. I think all artists get burnout um, at some point, and I don't know if that's what you mean by boredom, but I, I call it burnout when you've just done it so much and you just, you know, don't want to put on the costume. You just don't feel yeah. like it until you get on stage, and then you hear the audience and you interact with guests and volunteers of the show. And uh, for me, at least. Um, it reignites that excitement that I had when I first started performing. Uh, certainly the monotony of having to set up the decks of cards and doing the tricks and putting on the, you know, the, the makeup and the uh, costume and all that, that can be tiresome. But I think, isn't that true for anyone? Uh, anyone, anyone in the job, you can have, you know, Mondays and Mondays are those days where we just don't really want to go to work. Yeah. Um, but that's the same thing with magic. And then, you know, then you get a new inspiration, a new spark. Um, the fun thing is that, especially with, with magicians, is that we can change our acts up and do a little bit different effects. Um, I have to be honest that a lot of my act has stayed fairly similar through the, the decades, uh, because again, I'm, I'm kind of limited on what I can do. I certainly can't do a magic trick, you know, using the new iPhone and something that just wouldn't fit with my character. I have to use things like, you know, 18th century playing cards and, you know, quills and pens and so forth, because that's, again, that's my character, that's my time period. So I am a little bit limited in that, but it does also spark imagination um, where I can occasionally can come up with things that um, are different because I can take modern concepts and apply it to the olden days and apply it to old things. So I have that extra little, bo little bit to keep me from getting bored, hopefully. Uh, okay. That's what I, I, I look forward to at least. Yeah. So is the pay good? <laughs> um, is it good? I think, isn't that a relative question? It, um, it, 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 <laughs> it, it comes and goes, um, you know, just like any, any gig. I really, I mean, to be honest, I'm a gig performer is what I am. I'm one of those gig workers that they talk about in, in the press today. So things are, are very well sometimes and then other times not so much. I mean, obviously this last year, March of last year in 2020, all of my gigs, all of my acts for the year canceled. And just, yeah. I, it was happened within like a three or four day period that all of a sudden I just had a completely blank calendar. And yeah, that was very, and, stop, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of American, a lot of the world experienced that. Yeah. And um, that was a little bit fearful, but luckily I was able to pivot quickly. I have a, a background, my training is actually in television production. And um, I worked in Los Angeles at two of the local TV stations there as a producer. So I have the ability to create video. I know how to do it. And I quickly pivoted to build a studio um, in my home and um, use what I knew from my knowledge from the past. I had to dust off some of my old college textbooks, but um, I was able to pivot and be able to, I guess, survive the past year. I wouldn't want to say um, pros prosper, but I did survive and was able to get a number of gigs. And um, so, yes, the money is, you know, it, it's there. It's certainly not the reason that I do it. <laughs> um, I don't think that that's the, uh, the driving force to get rich off of magic. Um, although what I love to tell the story is in the 18th century, in the early 19th century, magicians were getting rich. The, the really? folks who were 
performing back then, uh, they were very successful. Their ticket prices were the equivalent of two to $300. I and mean, it was like seeing a Hamilton show. Um, it was a high demand ticket. It was hard to get into, uh, primarily because they were performing in parlors. So it was a small, small stage, but uh, they were performing for the Lords and ladies. So they were very, very well off. And uh, so if I could emulate them, that would be great. I would love to be able to uh, ride around in a gold carriage like many of them did, but I, I can't. I just am a, a humble conjurer. But, okay. uh, you know, and we have, here, let me show you something. This is something fun. What I always get that asked that question of how magicians make money back in the 18th century. This is what I show them. It's just a little demonstration of, this is what we do to make money back then. We just kind of make it out of thin air. And, and that's really, and it's real. It's real, real dollar coin. Um, so that's about as much as I get paid per act, about a dollar. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I'm sure you ain't gonna tell me how you do that. I thought I did it fairly well, um, <laughs> but it's totally up to you to decide how I did it. I, I, I didn't burn myself. That's always a success when I don't burn myself. My partner's back there laughing at me. She always, I burn myself fairly frequently when I do that, don't I? Yes. Well, so do you have tricks that ever go sour on the stage, things that don't work out just like they're supposed to? All the time, yeah. <laughs> all the time. And, and that's part of the fun. I mean, obviously we prepare for, I mean, rehearsals and practices and, and training, that's supposed to prepare you to be able to handle it. But there's an occasion when things go wrong. And surprisingly enough, sometimes that's actually when you get the best act. Um, I, I, I have a, a video, actually a great story of a, a time when I had an audience member who um, consumed a tad bit too much alcohol and decided to volunteer to be my assistant during part of the trick. And she was just drunk and was not able to perform everything, but she made it so entertaining for the audience because everyone knew she was you know, well gone beyond. And I, of course, had to stay in my best character, but um, those things happen. Of course, there's also times when I make a mistake and, Usually we have in magic, you know, different outs and we don't always know the outcome of how things are going to be. You know, we often will go down a path in, in doing an effect or doing a trick. And, and I like to call them effects. I don't like calling them tricks because um, when we speak of a trick, that means we're going to try to trick someone. That's not my goal. My goal is to have a fun entertainment and interaction. So I'd rather show you an effect. But when I go down the path of doing an effect, it doesn't always end up the way you want it to. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the, you know, the trick when I shoot the card. Um, there was one time in an establishment that I was in and I could not, it was very, very dark. It was a dark goth, goth, gothic style club and um, I couldn't see. So I couldn't see the deck of cards to hit it. I think I tried that one at least three or four times. Eventually I just had to give up because I just, I just wouldn't work. And um, that, that happens. And uh, you know, occasionally that does happen. I have another uh, effect that I do where a, um, a signed piece of paper, actually a, a playing card ends up inside of an orange, which is a, a common routine that magicians end up doing. And um, I used to use a nice sharp serrated knife to cut the orange open until I made a nice slice across my finger in the middle of doing that. And of course, the orange juice mixed with the finger cut, that was a painful one as it burned, but uh, the show must go on. And the audience had no idea I did it. I just wrapped my finger with the handkerchief and moved on and uh, hoped I didn't bleed too much on the stage. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that happens. But I mean, there's lots of stories that lots of magicians, I've actually been fairly lucky that um, I've, I've planned a lot of my act to be, I guess, I don't want to say foolproof, foolproof, but it can be. I, I try to make things that work, uh, that have backups, I guess I could say that if something doesn't work, I have another way to do it. And um, when I teach magic, I'm also a magic teacher. I often talk to my students about that. Make sure that you have a few different ways that you can end the trick just in case it doesn't work the way you wanted. If the, the card that you were looking for isn't in the spot that you thought it would be, or you forgot to set up something in advance, um, you know, just so you have an extra out, just in yeah. case. But even when you're best prepared, things happen. And then usually in most cases, you can get your audience to laugh with you. And as I you know, often say, hey, this is magic. It's not science. Doesn't always work, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then you move on. So, what's your most difficult effect that you do? Most difficult. Um, well, gosh, 
that's a very good question. I haven't really been asked that one before. Um, they're all challenging in their own unique ways. Um, some of them require a lot more setup. So there's a lot more advanced um, building of it. And if that's not done correctly, then that can be very, very difficult. Um, there are some that require more dexterity where it's a movement of my fingers or something like that. And that actually can be considered um, a little bit more difficult. Honestly, a lot of, a lot of the tricks with, that involve fire, I do a few that involve fire. Um, in the 18th century, um, firearms and smoke and fire were very commonly used in acts. And those, I, I mean, I admit, I have burned myself many a time. And um, those are very dangerous. Using any kind of fire in any trick, is, it's real. This is, it's real flame. Um, it's very hot. And <laughs> so when you get your fingers close to flame, it can be difficult and it can be dangerous. And um, I often singe the hairs off of my fingers. And uh, again, when I teach magic, you know, the, I often get my students who say, oh, teach me some fire magic. I go, no, not, you don't want to know that. It's very dangerous. It's the first thing, actually, I spend the full first lesson talking about safety, making sure you have a fire extinguisher nearby and that you have, you know, you've gone through safety precautions and your assistant knows how to put out fires and uh, those types of things. So um, the, 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 that's really, I think, where the, the, the difficulty comes in. And then a lot of it has to do with, once you just practice things and start doing things over and over, it gets easier. I think it just becomes naturally easy. So um, some of the tricks that have taken me a long time to learn, um, obviously card handling is difficult. And, and it's very interesting is in magic, we, you know, a lot of magicians use decks of cards, play bicycle is what we most magicians use, all other things like that. And our modern cards are very different than what I end up having to use. These are much more like a cardboard card stock. You can see that. And um, they don't allow you to do the same effects that you would be able to do with a modern deck of playing cards. You can just tell because it's actually almost double the thickness of a normal deck of cards. So a lot of the moves that modern magicians use, um, I, I can't, well, I can replicate, but I have to do it in my own weird way. So it just makes it a little bit more, I mean, I guess the word would be, yeah, it makes it a little bit more difficult because um, things that we take for granted as magicians, um, moves and, and card manipulation that a lot of magicians do, I can't do it um, because it just, the playing cards don't slide. There's uh, the other, the modern playing cards actually have a textured surface on it that makes it easy to slide cards. So you can do something like a fan or the car, I can't even do it, where the cards come out equally. You, you cannot do this with the car, well, you can, it's just very difficult to do a good fan. I can't even go to do a good fan with these. Um, because again, it's just cardboard. These are just pieces of cardboard and trying to get them to slide evenly without the, the with, what the modern decks are called airfoil. There's an airfoil resistance between them. So there's a slight bit of air in them. That's how magicians do that beautiful fan when the cards go out in the beautiful fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, I can't, I really, I cannot do it well. I do fake ones, <laughs> I do them like this, <laughs> which which still go. gives the general effect, yeah, it. but it's um, it's the very different. And <laughs> um, so I, when I chose to start doing the 18th century playing cards, I knew right away there was just going to be some things that are just going to be too difficult to do. And um, I adapted. And you just, I changed my act and changed the way I do handling of, of things. And um, it makes it fun and uh, you know, a little more challenging for me to come up with those little uh, things. Of course, I look at it, that's what the, the, the performers in the 18th and 19th century, that's what they had to deal with. They yeah. had that. I mean, they didn't have modern playing cards with you know, lovely uh, you know, polishes on them that were able to slide and do all those things. They had to deal with cardboard. So <laughs> that's what they had. Okay. Now, are you self-employed? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, obviously, I work wherever, wherever and anyone wants to hire me. I do corporate gigs and private parties. Um, still a lot of virtual Zoom stuff, which is great because I, I can be anywhere in the world in a moment's notice. Um, yeah. It's been fun this past year because I've been able to perform in, see, well, probably four continents, I believe I've done so far. Um, often in the same day, which is great. I did an Australian show and a UK show within a few hours of each other. And that would not be normally possible uh, um, unless I had some really good magic of being able to transform myself from one continent to another. But um, yeah. yes, absolutely. I, I'm self-employed and I'm always looking to, to, to perform for anyone. I mean, really what I like to do is just share my magic and share the experience and, and talk with people about you know, conjuring. Yeah. 
Is there any more effects you want to show us that you can do now? Would you like to see some stuff? I can show you some other sure. things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, what I've actually been able to do since I've been stuck here in quarantine, which I always find is remarkable because in the 18th century, they too were often in quarantine um, on and off throughout the time period, usually for things like yellow fever, uh, which of course we know now is caused by mosquitoes, but back then they thought it was an airborne illness. So they would have quarantines and trap people inside. So there's many stories of the theaters closing and the parlors closing and the, the conjurers being indoors, but they would often have to find things to be able to do to entertain themselves. And uh, which was of course the same thing we had to deal with in the last year. And what I like to do is I like to read but I always have a problem, and I don't know, Steve, if you have the same problem, but trying to pick the right book, uh, especially after a year, you've kind of gone through your whole library and read everything. So I decide to do something a little different. I call upon the magical spirits to help me pick a book because I figure they can make a better recommendation than I can in most cases. Uh, allow me to demonstrate. Uh, I have a few of my books here. What I do is I just take my bell and I just do a little ring and call upon them. Oh, spirits, send me a book and the spirits will pick a book for me, just like that. Uh, this time they picked, uh, oh, it is a book written in French. I cannot read French, so not really a very good selection. Thank you, spirits, for that one. Uh, maybe we'll try another book. Uh, spirits, send me another book. Oh, here's a better one, let's see. Oh, much better. The Complete Works of Mark Twain. That one I can read. That one I can read. I'll read this one after we're done with our, our conversation. But that, that's one of the things that I, I do here in the 18th century. Um, what else can I show you? Oh, I know. Well, I wasn't talking about the playing cards. I'll show you a little demonstration of some of the playing cards that I do. So uh, playing cards were very common, actually, back in the 18th century. This was, this was their iPhone. This is what they did for entertainment. Uh, there's a whole room they created for it called the drawing room where people would withdraw to play cards. The cards that they played back then were different than what we play. They play a game called whist and fortunes were won and lost playing whist. I, I have difficulty finding people who want to play whist with me. Um, it's just a challenge that I have and I'll, I'll show you why. Um, here, Steve, I will flip through the cards like this and you tell me when to stop. We'll just pick a card anywhere in here. Uh Right there, perfect, good. Take a look at your card. Oops, come on, one of them, doesn't matter, there you go. Hopefully you can see that. Yes. Normally I would have you write your name on it so you can make sure you remember it, but you will remember what that card is and where that card is. So perfect, what I will do is, um, actually you know what we'll do is we'll shuffle the deck, make sure your card is well lost inside the deck of cards. Hopefully you can still see my hands. I wanna make sure that you're there. Um, Actually, we'll do it a couple more times just to make sure. Usually at this point, I drop a card or two, but I'm doing well today, actually not dropping any cards. I'm surprised. <laughs> I don't know. Um, see, is this your card right here on the bottom of the deck? That's not mine, no. Yes, no, 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 okay. No. Good. Uh, is that your card on top of the deck? No. No, okay, good, perfect. So therefore, your card is somewhere between the top of the deck and the bottom of the deck. Something we call, in ma magic, we call that the middle of the deck. I don't know if you call it that way, but watch carefully, a quick snap. And your card travels to the top of the deck. Wow, that's very good, very good. That, that's about the reaction I usually get too, Olsen. Um, but we're not done yet. What we'll do is we'll put your card, actually let's put your card right back in the middle of the deck and do it again. Another snap and your card's back right on top. Yeah, I'm that's the reason why no one will play whist with me. Yeah. I'm happens, sure. so. <laughs> very good, very good. But those are the types of silliness that I do. And often it's just having fun. And through this whole COVID thing, actually most of this, actually pretty much everything I do now in, in my interior, I don't do in my stage show. Um, I had to come up with a whole different, uh, again, because usually my acts, I have an assistant, you know, someone from the audience here to assist me the entire show. And um, it's very different when you can't have them pick a card and can't have them write their name on the card. Those kind of things make it very, very different um, than obviously, you know, performing on, on Zoom. Yeah. So I had to be able to adapt things for, you know, internet, for the web. And um, it's funny when I usually perform, I often will make comments about these things. And, and the character I really play is I play that we've gone into the 18th century. You've traveled back in time to the early 18th, early 19th century, late 18th century, so that um, I can make comments about you know the zoom and this weird box that is capturing me and um i often have fun with that one too when i play along but 
Yeah. Those are some of the things that I do. So how much longer do you think you'll do this? I plan to do this forever, I hope. Um, I mean, hopefully I won't be stuck indoors forever. Um, yeah. I, I look forward to having in-person live shows again. And um, the fun thing, actually, I have to say a positive about this past year has been um, being able to do a lot more teaching. I've spent a lot more time with students around the globe um, doing classes over the internet, over Zoom, and um, exposing a lot more people to, to magic. I do magic consulting for adults, for theater companies, um, as well as uh, teaching for, for kids and adults as well. And uh, I, I really structure my classes to be able to adjust for anyone who, who's interested. So that's been one thing that's very fun. And I hope, I hope that continues. I hope I'm still able to do more classes through Zoom because I, I think there are some people who are in, I wanna say remote locations, but locations that don't have an abundance of magicians who teach um, because it does take a special skill to be a teacher, obviously, and to be able to mm -hmm. explain things to people. And there might be a magician in the local town, but they may not have a teacher uh, of magic there. And it's really important for, for people who are beginning in magic to have a, a mentor or someone who can guide them through it. Obviously, you can read mm -hmm. books, you can watch YouTube on videos on how to do a magic trick, but um, sometimes it takes a magician who's done it to help you with little things like, oh, you know, move your finger to the third position or, you know, drop your coin down slightly, things that you may not be able to figure out through a book or through the internet. Um, and it's helpful, I think, especially when you can do it over Zoom. I, you know, there are certainly something to say about being in person and that's nice, but um, I look forward to doing a lot more in-person shows. Um, I'm also an MC, I'm a, I, I often host shows too. So uh, more hosting, more live shows and, I will continue doing this until I can no longer do this or until someone tells me to stop. Okay. Which I've been told to stop, but I don't listen to them. But I mean, really tells me to stop. Yeah. Like a doctor, maybe. Okay. So who was your inspiration or role model? Interesting. Um, if you look back, so I, I emulate myself off of uh, Giuseppe Panetti uh, from the 1790s. He performed up to the, about the 1820s. And he's really where I kind of base my character off of. But I don't know if I would say that is necessarily my inspiration. Um, you know, growing up as a kid, I watched, you know, David Copperfield on TV and Lance Burton and all of those big stage illusionists, which is not what I do <laughs> in any way. I don't do their type of entertainment, the Las Vegas style. But um, I think if anything, I probably was more influenced by a lot of the, you know, the Charlie Chaplin's and the Buster Keatons and those, uh, you know, 1920s style movie comedy kind of uh, performers. Um, and just the fact that they were able to play characters and have fun with it and play with the audience and, um, you know, enjoy what they did. That's probably where I got, you know, my biggest influence. I do have to admit that I did spend many years working at Disneyland in Southern California. I was a ride operator there with the Haunted Mansion and the Jungle Cruise and Pirates of the Caribbean. And I think that also played a lot of influence in the way I, I think of magic. Um, I, I try to make a, a full immersive experience for my audience to truly try to get them into the moment to help them understand it. Obviously there's some limitations when you're on a stage. I can't have the audience walk back in time, but boy, I would love to. It would be really yeah. amazing to do it. Uh, often I get to perform in old houses where I actually am in the space. And, and usually when I get to those places, a lot of the time the audience is also in costume and that makes it a much more immersive experience. And so for, for me, I, um, you know, one of the, the tenets that Disney has taught is Disney likes to touch all the senses. They wanna have the sense of smell and taste and feel and, and, and basically create a, a full immersive experience. And I, I love to do that in magic. It's not always possible, but I love to be able to do that when I perform so that the people, my yeah. audience feels as though they're back in time, actually watching an 18th century conjurer in their own parlor or in their guest parlor. So. Um, that is definitely a, an influence that I have taken from, you know, Disney company in general. So thank you, Disney, for that. Um, and you mentioned the word parlor. They used to call them parlor tricks also, didn't they? That is exactly where it comes from, is this time period, is that they would have been performed in parlors, and, and that's where the parlor trick term came from, and which is, I think is uh, interesting because it, there's not a lot of magicians who still perform in parlors, and I prefer performing in a parlor. I mean, this is basically our parlor in our house. Um, we actually live in an older home, a 1900s home. And so this is our parlor room and I'm just doing it through Zoom. 
But uh, no, that's exactly where the term comes from. And for many years, that's where magicians, the top magicians were performing all the way up to about the Victorian age. It was about that 1840s, 1850s, when magicians started to go on the theater circuit more than in parlors. But, um, and that's the era that I, I, I go for that parlor era. Yeah. And that's what I do. And, and the type of magic that I perform is called parlor magic. This is exactly as you said, these are all parlor magic effects. Now, was it typical back in that day for the uh, magicians to call themselves professor? Is that, is that part of it? Is it? Absolutely. Yeah. The, um, the term in the 18th century, the term magic or magician really took on a, a negative tone. There was a, an encyclopedia, a French encyclopedia, Diderot, as it was called, that defined a magician as the odious sort, uh, someone to be avoided at all costs. Um, magic was born of the time of our woes. That's how they described magic. So um, magicians, smart thinking, decided to no longer call themselves magicians and took on terms like conjurers or professor of natural philosophy, um, natural philosophers, um, those types of things to try to align themselves with a little more positive attitude uh, of magic. And it was also, uh, the, the, you know, the age of enlightenment certainly allowed magic to come out of the religion side, but um, it was also kind of still touchy with the church. I mean, you have to understand that was, the church still had a little bit of influence, a lot of influence. And if you tried to cross that spiritual side, it got a little dangerous. You could actually end up, you know, at the wrong end of a, of a, of a rope. And um, you wouldn't want to do that or, you know, burning at the stake, depending on the type of neighborhood you were in. So uh, you didn't want to really risk that. And the way around it was that we called ourselves you know, scientists. Before the term scientist was around, uh, we really were doing scientific discovery. A lot of the, the magic involved showing experiments and um, playing with a lot of those new innovations. Because again, in that age of enlightenment right there in the, uh, the late 18th century, early 19th, um, science was advancing very quickly and discoveries were being made all the time. And um, the magicians, the conjurers of the period, we took it upon ourselves to display it to the audiences. We took it out in the field and showed it to the public. While the scientists were inventing it back in their labs, we were the ones demonstrating it. Uh, although in most cases, we didn't know what it could do yet. Uh, things like you know magnet, mag magnets and um, a lot of uh, electrical things, because there was a, certainly electricity was being invented, was being harnessed, but we didn't know what it could do. We didn't understand exactly what it did, but um, magicians, we toyed with it. So in my act, I have a whole 18th century magic electric generator that I use for a trick. And um, I, we know that they were being done. The magicians had them on stage, we know it. What it's hard to understand is exactly what they did with it and how they explained it. But in a lot of cases, it was just making sparks and that was enough to entertain the audience because that was magical to them. They've okay. never seen lightning contained in a small area. Um, and you know, to us, it would just be called static electricity, but to them, it was lightning and it was amazing. Uh, so those types of things. There's a, a great story of the first discovery of laughing gas. And it was a magician who actually helped uh, introduce the first medical use of laughing gas. For many years, magicians would perform acts using laughing gas. They bring an audience member up, have them take a, a whiff of the laughing gas, and then they would stumble around on stage, you know, basically intoxicated by the laughing gas. And uh, one, one performance in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, a dentist was watching the show and one of the audience members fell and hit their head and, and to a point where they should have been in pain and the person continued laughing and continued stumbling around the stage. And at which point the dentist said, I have an idea for this. And the next day he had the conjurer bring a bottle of laughing gas and he did a tooth extraction under the influence of the laughing gas. And of course, no pain at the time. So those are the types of discoveries that were being uh, taken. And, and the magicians, we weren't making the innovations. We were not doing necessarily, well, we, some of us were, but most, for the most part, magicians weren't making the scientific discoveries. We were taking them from the scientists and showing them to the public and then using our own imaginations on how we would manipulate them and what we would do yeah. with them. And sometimes having to do a magic trick to make it work. Yeah. Well, you certainly do educate people along with your effects. So that's, I have to say, you're one of the most interesting people I have interviewed. I really enjoy talking to you. 
Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I had a great time talking with you. It's, it's fun yeah. to talk about it. You know, I, I like to talk about magic. I like to talk about history. So it's great when I can put the two together. And, yeah. and the great thing about it is a lot of people don't know the time period anymore. Even, ma yeah. even magicians. Most magicians don't realize that this existed at this time period. And uh, in magic, we call the golden age of magic is right when Harry Houdini was around. That was the big, you know, that's the golden age. Everybody's so all the way heard between, of him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's heard of Harry Houdini. And it's really between that 1890s and 1920s. That's the golden age. So most magicians and most of the public think of magic right then. And they don't realize that there was a whole generation before them that really helped to teach folks like Harry Houdini you know, the art of what to do and how to do it and really change magic from being a negatively looked down upon thing to, you know, a positive, you know, entertainment form. And, and part of that was because really, if you go way back in history, a lot of the magicians were also con men and they were thieves. Yeah. And so they did their magic in a way that um, would steal from people and they would take, you know, they would take things from people. And that's, that's the early, early magic. So it was really that transition period that I do where we, where we started to dress like gentlemen and we started to come, or, or ladies, and come inside and perform for the lords and ladies in a safe way, um, which was, you know, a much better way of entertaining. And then that really cleared the path for folks like Harry Houdini, who then could perform in, you know, vaudeville theaters and the, and, and the big music halls and things like that um, for respected audiences. And of course, we, we know of Houdini still to this day. Yeah. So do you think people were more easily impressed back then? I would think they would be. They weren't, they weren't really as educated. I, yes, and um, I think their imaginations and their minds were a little more open for some of those things. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if I guess to say it would be education or if it just they didn't, you know, they were more accepting. I'm not sure. I, 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 would, I, I, I don't want to put them down because that's what we commonly in our, our modern day say, oh, they weren't as educated. Well, they might have been. Uh, the, the folks that we were entertaining for, the lords and ladies, they certainly thought themselves as being educated. But then again, they just didn't know. And um, as a lot of people say is, uh, you know, the lack of knowledge from for history is the, you know, the, the, the what do they say, the science of tomorrow. I don't know if you're hearing me now or not, but you froze up. I don't hear you and I don't see you moving. Hopefully I'm back. Am I okay. back at all moving? Okay. okay, now you're back. You, you froze for about 30 seconds there. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> well, there's a magic trick for you. There you go. <laughs> if I could just fix the internet. There you go. There, there's magic. There you go. <laughs> But I, yeah, I mean, I think you you have a very good point. I, I uh, you know, there are some some effects back long ago that you just couldn't do today um, because yeah. we just know uh, a great trick. Uh, again, when I when, when the conjurers performed back then, everything was under candlelight. There was no stage lighting, no switches, and there was an effect back then. And of course, keep in mind that those would have to be you're talking hundreds of candles, and so it was very common if you're going to perform in a ballroom or at a, a stage, it would take a good you know, half hour to an hour to illuminate all the candles in there before the show. And um, there was a conjurer back in the early 19, um, 19, uh, sorry, 19th century who uh, came on stage and it was completely dark and the audience saw no lights and they all knew there was gonna be a while till the show started. And he walked out with his pistol and he said, I apologize for this delay and fired off the pistol and instantly all of the candles in the entire auditorium uh, ballroom lit up. And he was using gas lamps, but they hadn't heard of gas lamps yet. And so it was a spark and a gas lamp and they all ignited. But it was brand new technology. No one had heard of it. And it was an amazing effect for the audience. Nowadays, we would just know it's the same thing that lights our barbecue. Yeah. Um, because that's exactly what it is. It's the exact same thing that lights your barbecue. It's a, a gas with a spark and it goes off. So yeah. those types of things, yes, they would not play at all today for audiences. We would not be at all excited about it. Uh, just like, you know, a light switch today is not a big deal. But if you think 200 years ago, a light switch would have been a very impressive uh, magical effect. Yeah. But um, I can't say that they're necessarily less educated. They just, 
it was a different time, right? It was a very different time. Yeah. Um, and they did things very differently. But the great thing is that some of the magic still does translate. And it's actually fun to go back to some of those old um, effects that have not been seen for 200 years. And then the audiences today go, wow, that's amazing. And you go, well, yes, it was amazing 200 years ago and it's still amazing today. We just stopped doing it for 200 years. Yeah. And uh, you know, it, it's actually the, I, I, didn't, I don't, don't have it with me, but my spark machine, it's called a, um, a Wimshurst machine and it, it, it's a static electric generator. Afterwards, I leave it on stage and let the audience just play with it because it's just fun to make, you know, little, you're making lightning bolts that are like about that big, but it's still fun to play with. And um, I, you know, again, modern audiences, we know how to make a static electricity. Everyone does it with their socks as they go along and walk, walk on the carpet with their socks and then touch the, touch the doorknob. Uh, we know how to do that, but it's fun to do it with the machine and actually control it and, and those types of manipulations. And I think that's the same uh, curiosity that the audiences of long ago had. And that's what I hope we can still spark a little bit of that imagination. Um, and it's not just kids, it's adults too. Adults oh, love yeah. to play with that oh, spark yeah. machine. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, the 18th century magicians, we wouldn't perform for kids. There would never be a kid in the audience. Um, it was very, oh. very uncommon. It was very common to not have any kids because again, it was an adult show that was very expensive and we were performing for the lords and ladies. And so um, they would never have the children in. It wasn't until Houdini's time really that uh, Houdini was very good at embracing the kids. He actually would give out free tickets to, to youth and to kids, um, often going to the local orphanages and offering free tickets to all the orphans to be able to have them come and see a show for free. And so that's yeah. kind of where that connection between the kids came was that Houdini, that golden age, um, Houdini and Thurston, those folks. Okay. Professor, thank you for being my guest today. I have enjoyed talking with you. And can you tell people how to find you on the internet or how they can see your show? Absolutely. I am on the interweb there uh, at www.historicalconjurer.com. And you can spell conjurer with an O-R or E-R. Either of them will get to me. I'm also on Facebook as Dr. Schreiber. You can look for me there. Uh, either of those ways, send me an email. I'm at historicalconjurer at gmail.com. Uh, any of those ways to reach out to me, let me know. And, and I'm happy to you know, teach classes or perform for you on Zoom. Or if you're in my local area, I travel out to where you're based, I can perform for you in person as well. But lots okay. of ways to get in touch with me. Very good. Thank you, sir. Well, and Stephen, usually when I end my shows, I usually do a toast because, um, you know, of course, that's what we did then. But I don't have... Um, anything to toast with. If you would, would you mind, I'm just going to quickly send a note over to my handy tavern keep around the corner so I can get something to drink to toast with you really sure. quickly. I'll show you one more effect, hold on. Just have to make sure I send my order over to him perfectly. Everyone needs to have a handy tavern keep. That's one of those things we have in the 18th century where we just can order things, hold on, le leaking a little bit there. I'll send that over to him. Oh, perfect, good. We can just post a cup of very tea. good, very good. Steve, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and for allowing me to be a part of your one of your guests. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, folks. Thanks for tuning in to Holding On with Holder. Please subscribe to my channel and feel free to share this video all over social media. And be sure to go to the professor's website, and I guarantee you he'll teach you some things and entertain you both. Thank you, sir, and I will let you go. You have a wonderful day. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.